Thanks for coming. Um, sorry for a little tech issues here, but we're almost on time. Uh, so just want to share um, some of the les lessons we've been learning on my own farm and homestead for the last uh, <coughs> 10 years in this September. I'll be, have been there for 10 years. Um, so the system is still relatively new, but we've actually figured out uh, quite a number of, um, of strategies and, and solutions that we're working with. Um, given that it's a permaculture geared, perennial geared uh, system, it's really still a toddler as far as the lifespan of, of a system like this. So keep that in mind as you see the slides. You know, there's dozens of species of nuts, for instance, that won't start bearing for another five years, but they'll bear for 300 years. So we're not looking at what the whole system um, will do, but we're seeing a lot of uh, abundance and resilience already emerge. Um, so uh, we have a book coming out, as was mentioned, and there's some graphics I'll use from the book. Um, this one is a good overview of what we're trying to um, set up and, and how we think about the work that we're, we're doing. Um, so we see our site here in the, in the, in the top center as um, part of a few components, few other components where we interact with culture and help build culture. Um, where culture is, is built upon these units of the homestead, of the family, of landscapes throughout the world. And we produce yields, seen over here, and we need inputs to produce those yields. Now, ideally, we're producing the maximum amount of value for the minimum amount of input across time. Could you actually close that door? Thank you. <clears throat> so, just brief context, I want to start in the beginning, what we're responding to, why, why do we need resiliency? Of course, we're probably all pretty aware of that, but I want to just get us all on the same page. Um, you wouldn't be here if, unless you were in, weren't interested uh, in, seeing, in, in seeing the challenges on the, on, the, um, on the writing on the wall, so to speak. Um, then uh, regeneration and resiliency solutions is the, the focus of this. Thanks. It will help me focus to have things kind of closed here. Is this in your book? This is, yes. Uh -huh. But you'll see a variety of solutions I'll bring up in about 10 slides, which are part of 75 principles, strategies, solutions, which are in the book. And I'm just highlighting about 10 of them right now and showing examples of how those are applied. Okay, so um, what are we responding to? Well, if uh, you can simplify it to this extent, a brief history of, of where we're at today. I like to think of it with uh, these four slides. You know, most people on, on planet Earth pretty closely connected with their daily sustenance sources, with their resources. Unless you're in the, you know, elite classes, you knew roughly where your food and most of your uh, daily um, sustenance came from, your, your heat. Um, we got the car in the suburbs. We got World War II and all, all of its technology. We got the suburbs and what's next, right? We think this, for the most part, a lot of folks out there anyway think this can go on forever. Um, we know that the opposite is true, of course, this actually can't last for very long. You can't replace a society of producers with a society of consumers and uh, have, some, have a steady state situation. So we can argue about you know, all manner of things, our politics, our religion um, can, can um, shade us in this color or that, but we can all agree that um, you just can't go down this road, this one-way street, for very long, right? It takes, it's too destructive. To, to kind of have the situation we've set up today. Does anyone know where this is? It could be China. Yeah, they're going to start in on this if they haven't already. Tar sands in Alberta, right? So continental scale, you know, oil age part two, the part that's really going to hurt, right? The, the oil age we've had so far, I like to think of as the green. That's the lead certified part of the oil age, <laughs> right? Because it was already oil. It was our, the earth already made it into liquid for us. We just had to drill down and pump it up. Or sometimes it even came up on its own. Now we have to wring it from rock, right? Because we've scavenged all the easy resources that were roughly close to the surface. And now we're just going down and down and down. Of course, the earth had to cool for billions of years and these toxins had to be locked away for, for life to really flourish the way it has. And now we're digging this back up. So uh, I'll talk about the toxicity piece, but to me that's actually becoming the biggest challenge is the toxicity that this all brings about. Um, you know, whether it's oil or natural gas, if we don't change 180 degrees from where we're headed right now, right, you'll, you don't change direction, you get where you're going, right, that old adage, we will frack out all, hopefully there's not much gas there, but we're going to frack it all out unless some major 
revolution happens, we're going to drill and, and pull this all to the surface. Um, right, we're right here, so we're five events in 400,000 years as so we're starting to uh, get beyond in terms of carbon and climate change. We all already know this, but this is what it looks like, right? The zone, climate zone maps moving north. So that brings up a lot of challenges, but a lot of solutions too. And in permaculture and resilience in general, right, it's our job to turn problems into solutions. We have to make this phenomenon right here a solution and really not spend so much time focusing on the problems of it. I mean, yeah, it's problematic and it's happening more and more rapidly. I mean, we're going, if we need to be at 350, according to Bill McKibben, well, where are we going? <laughs> we're not going, you know, this is real hopeful. If you literally take China, India, and tar sands out of the equation and, and enlighten Barack Obama and everyone else, you might get there, right? But where we're going is here, right? So we have to plan on, you know, this might actually be plan, B, plan A, not plan B. This really is all likelihood plan B. Uh, but even if you think, well, we, we're going to turn this ship around, we still need to think about plan B as, as people that are interested in resiliency. So what does the world look like if we're at 900 or 1,000 parts per million of carbon? Um, you know, what kinds of, of, um, of resiliency do we need in our systems? How robust do our systems need to be? What does that look like? Of course, we need the most robust systems ever devised to deal with these challenges, right? You don't need to read the title of any of these graphs to, to get the picture, right? We're here. This can't last very long. What's it look like? Well, usually, of course, it looks like recorrection. Maybe it could look like the horizontal curve. Uh, you look on the news and it's, think it's going to look like this, right? So disaster or opportunity. Again, opportunities where we have to probably put about 95 to 99 percent of our energy, I would, um, I would posit anyway. So for us, that, that means not getting involved in politics, even though that's great, and I'm, I'm glad there's people fighting the, the trenches out there. For us, me personally, it means changing my landscape to be as solution-oriented as possible, to be as much a part of the solution, as, le as little a part of the problem as possible, and to deal with these changes as they're coming, not to kind of hope that, I do hope things will shift, but to also plan on them not changing globally and getting potentially much worse. So we look around the world at similar climates to draw solutions out. So this line represents climate analogs to Vermont and New England, right? It's not a line of latitude, even though people say, oh, go along the 40th parallel. Well, things like the Gulf Stream make that not true. You know, you go along the 40th parallel, you're in Spain and you're growing olives. You're not doing what we, what we uh, have to do here. You're in very cold parts of the world. You're in um, Northern Europe, you know, Central Asia and Northeastern Asia, right? So Korea, um, China, northern China, Mongolia, a good chunk of Russia, which fortunately has one of the most developed pharmacopias in the world. They've been very close with plants for a very long time and on very scientific levels. And far northern Europe is the climate analog to us. Um, we're, we're a very, very cold place uh, as far as where people inhabit the world. But luckily, in large part because of that and because of the way water is distributed across the year and how even its distribution is, we are one of the most resiliency-tending landscapes on the planet. We're, one, we're really about the least brittle landscape you could have besides the British Isles and maybe the Pacific Northwest. And it's not because of how much rain we get overall, but it's how even that distribution is, right? It's like four to seven inches of precipitation per month, per year. Now, some months we won't get really any, but on a whole, as, as a whole, that's very averaged out to be very, very consistent. Now, that could change. But that, in part, uh, combined with our, our basically our, our deciduous system, our, our coniferous and deciduous northern, the northern hardwood and uh, boreal forest that we're a part of, because we have such a cold, long winter, this system mulches itself every year, right? So this is a road, town road. If it, it's a class four road now, if it's abandoned, what will be right here on the road within ten years? Saplings, right? This will turn right back into forest. We got to remember, Vermont, we cut down all of our trees quickly, in, a, in pretty short order, in a few decades, look like this, the entire state, basically 85% of it, right? We had a timber rush. This is the White River in Royalton, right? Our, ours wasn't gold, but it was logs. We took them all out. No one replanted, really, 
any. There was some red pines replanted and here and there some other species, but they all grew back. The forest grew back. Now, not the same trees. We're, we've, we're impoverished in the process. We don't have chestnuts. We don't really have almost any nuts in the forest anymore. Um, but this forest replanted itself simply because of our climate and how resilient, uh, how resilient tending it is. Here's a, you know, hemlocks growing on top of a rock, right? In the rest of the world, you cut down your forest, this is what you get, right? You get Desert. De desertification, deforestation are the same thing. We are incredibly lucky. We're one of the only places on the planet you can just wholesale liquidate your forests and not even make kind of a desert. So how do we work with that, that reality of this situation? And if we can't do it here, people are going to have a real tough time doing it elsewhere because this is what a lot of the world looks like, right? This is where agriculture emerged. I remember seeing this in grade school and thinking, uh, agriculture civilization emerged here like it doesn't look like you could grow much in this fertile and what's so fertile about the fertile crescent there's a little bit of fertility left well it was fertile they didn't tell us that part it was really really fertile agriculture and civilization didn't emerge in a desert <laughs> it emerged in a garden right in a major productive garden but we desertified it very quickly in short order so we know we have a power to destroy very quickly um, Understanding that power is key to understanding how to regenerate, right? There's a little bit of fertility left, and this is what I want to get into next is how water works in the system is key to all of this. So what's happening here? The only fertility left and what was once the Fertile Crescent is where? The Nile. the Nile Delta, right? So this is all fertile because of soil from the highlands of Central Africa, right? This is all the water. This is because of mountains and forests that this is green. Right, so let's just remember, look at all that soil, all the soil in the Mediterranean right there. Um, remember this as we go forward. So right now, we're not doing a great job of paying attention to this as a whole. Our, most of our agriculture still looks like this. Right? Most of our agriculture is still dairy focused, still annual focused. It's still a bare soil agriculture. Right? So we're doing our darndest, pretty much, to make a desert, but it's not happening that quickly. It is happening over time um, with our agriculture right now. Right? These we should call soil compaction machines. They're really, we like to call them manure spreaders, but I guess if you put rocks in there, you can make them a little heavier. And if you narrow the wheels up a little more, you can compact your soil a little bit more. But it does a pretty darn good job of, um, of damaging what is left of the soil food web in your field every year. So as a result of, of this and also of our residential development in some places on our roads specifically, this is how our water systems function right now. And I want to spend about five minutes on this because it underlays everything else I'll be getting into. So here's a ditch, road ditch by my house. We got an inch of rain on, on this day. It was about a year ago. And I'm walking by. This is what the, the water looked like in the road ditch. I luckily had my camera on me. And half an hour later, it looked like this. Same spot. Right, you can see the same rocks actually. Okay, so what's happening? This is the magic, very bad magic moment that happens every rainstorm in this climate. What's happening? Uh, water is charged to leave the land and flow to the same spot. Right, water is shunted off and with it goes soil. Right, so this right here, you can see the demise of civilizations in a road ditch, just in a little spot. Right, so we're conveyor belting by the millions of truckloads our soil that's taken a long, long time to accrue on the hills into Lake Champlain, our, our, this part of New England's stormwater detention basin. Right? So during Hurricane Irene, it looks like this, right? Small little rivulets turn into straight up streams. Oops. I'm sorry to so I'm just going to continue because I'm going to run over as, as it is. Uh, so during Tropical Storm Irene, this is what our water systems started to look like. Right? So What's happening here is an enormous pulse, right? This is a shock to the system. And it's a shock that is um, it, that we need to accept. It's just part of uh, the law of living in this part of the world, right? We get big rainstorms. This actually, Tropical Storm Irene only dropped six inches of rain on uh, the property I live on. That's not that that's not that insane. A lot of parts of the world get six inches of rain multiple times a year, and they don't lose major pieces of their infrastructure. We're just not used to this here. We have a very mild climate for the most part. So this is a factor of like 100, right? We go from 60, 80 CFS cubic feet a second to over, it went over 20,000. My power went out right after I took this snapshot on my computer. And so I couldn't capture that, the full, the full magnitude of the shock. This is the Mad River 
cubic feet a second of the Mad River going up, right? We really should have another bar, another unit that says, you know, amount, number of drum trucks of soil per second, right? Not just cubic feet. Because look at that, you know, freight train of soil moving to Lake Champlain. All right, so that's happening every time we get a major rain event or even, you know, even minor rain events. And I think about more than half an inch in most of Vermont starts moving soil. Uh, you can look in the road ditches and see. Half an inch in a short period of time. Depends a lot on also snow cover and everything else. But so right at this same moment, half an hour, 20 minutes later, I drove back up the hill. I live 200 feet above this, this raging Himalayan scale river. This is what my farm looked like in Homestead. There's water running through swales, crystal clear. I was amazed. I figured we'd be moving a little bit of soil. After all, it's Tropical Storm Irene. There was no soil being moved across the landscape on my 10 acres. And we take water from another 15 acres above us at this time. So while this is happening in Moortown Village, this is what's happening up on my land. This is what down happened downhill, 200 feet in Moortown. This is what Lake Champlain looked like. It's amazing Lake Champlain isn't um, like a boggy, one big bog. It, it will be down the road eventually with all the soil moving into it, but uh, it's pretty deep. <laughs> it can hold a lot of soil. So meanwhile, this is happening here. The Icelandic sheep are, you know, they're not as happy as they've ever been, but they're, <laughs> they're doing all right. Um, and our, our pond filled. This pond was four feet down as the storm came in. It didn't fill until we, until we received about four plus inches of rain. So what I realized during the storm and after was that three-quarters of the storm, two-thirds to three-quarters we absorbed, never left the property and went down and contributed to the flooding and damage because we had our shock-absorbing nets cast wide open and were able to absorb a lot of that. It taught me that we could absorb a solid four inches, and now we have actually many more thousands of feet of swales than we had then, uh, so we can absorb even more. We were lucky, by the way, that Irene happened during the end of the growing season in the driest time of year. If it happened any other time of year, it would have been much more destructive. We had an enormous capacity in the landscape to absorb water when it happened. So, d you know, double that effect, it, it, you know, in all likelihood. Most hurricanes happen, like, in October and November, not at the end of August, um, September. So this is what's going on down in, Ma in, in uh, the Mad River Valley. And here's what's happening. Is the bottom pond on the, bottom the land of the pond on. is getting at the end of Irene. gallons a minute right now. After and you can see about five inches of rain in Hurricane can, Irene. I'll narrate it, but you can and there's see no silt in it through down four feet. It's totally clear pool. water. Um, and the water that's coming Even into this is rushing in at probably I don't know, you know twenty to fifty gallons, gallons a minute. Of water so this is the litmus test for us so far. In we spend hours on this in, in workshops just We're focused on this. Soil. I want to keep moving, but it's the basis of what I'm, what, of everything else I'm saying to you today, uh, at least on the biological end. So here's what these systems can look like, right? Here's systems that don't move soil, don't move water, don't convey it rapidly across the landscape. This doesn't happen to be the United States. Anyone know where this might be? This could be Northern Europe, yep. It, this actually happens to be in the north end of the South Island in New Zealand. But it could be in not the U.S. for the most part. Um, but this is a very productive commercial farm. But it's not a simplest, It's not a simplified ecosystem, right? There's hedgerows go running across the contour, so water has to slow, spread, and sink out. You have microclimate um, effects being created by all of the vertical structure, and you have major cropping of hops and kiwis and um, a dozen types of fruits going on within these cells, and then the actual hedgerows themselves that form the walls of the cells are productive as well. They also have a yield, uh, a fruit and nut yield. And look at this in contrast to what most of New Zealand looks like, which is two-dimensional agriculture, right, across the way here, which actually, in other talks I, I get into, but I don't have time today, is becoming a desert quickly. New Zealand, I was amazed to see what is a semi um, uh, brittle landscape becoming very brittle very quickly. I was there in the spring and, and major drainages were already dry, stopped running, because it's been so deforested in the last 50 years and over -sheeped. This is also what productive farm systems can look like, right? This actually is a farm. This isn't a planted nuttery, but it was planted by our great-grandparents, right? You can't, you can't get this in one generation. So this, is, this kind of system doesn't require any tillage, any inputs, really. It fertilizes itself. It's very resistant to shocks to the system, like flood, like major rain events, and like drought. 
because the roots go deep and it's protecting itself from the sky. So it's protected from drying and also protected from flooding. Right? Very robust type of system when we work with trees. And we look around the world and we see annual systems. And I can't believe I only learned this in the last few years uh, because I've been annual gardening for longer than that. But I realized that anywhere in the world where annual agriculture has been conducted for more than a few hundred years or isn't incredibly biointensive, like, fret, like Parisian gardener style, where it's really an extensive agriculture and it's on a sloping lands, this is what it looks like. Right? It's in Southeast Asia. They've had 4,000 year and running annual agriculture with the same plot of land is in production for literally thousands of years um, and can still produce year after year. So it's based in slowing, spreading, and sinking water. Right. So these are, this is, this is a rice paddies in northern Japan. You can see the rice planted here in some of these paddies. But they realized that it was more worthwhile to take generations by hand to dig dig paddies and swales and terraces, usually paddies, than to fight constantly every year the forces of gravity. Right? It's like rust never sleeps, gravity never sleeps, right? Constant work. So they realized it was actually less work and more successful to shape the land to a more optimal situation for performing annual agriculture, even in very steep places, and not just in the tropics. I'd always thought, well, this is, this is great, um, stupendous you know, example of, of a permanent presence of, of humanity in a durable way, and I thought it was only in warm places, and I saw this photo a few years ago, or four now, and it made me think, well, we, this could be Vermont. You know, well, we don't have landscapes that look like this. I want to start a nonprofit called Terrace Vermont. Right? Because if we intend to stay here and we still want to grow a lot of annuals, well, we can look to see what our brothers and sisters around the world did to stay and to hold their soil and water and nutrients on a slope. Um, but we don't have those reference points. We haven't been here long enough, I think is the main reason. And when we did let all of our soil and water run downhill in the 1800s with the sheep craze, we could then leave. And then the Industrial Revolution caught us on the way down. Right? We didn't have, all of a sudden, we didn't need the land base. To, for a sustenance. So it's been a perfect storm of, of allowing us not to realize that we haven't created a system that quite works so well. So if we think of these references, like I pointed out, the climate analogs, we start to see some of the patterns that's happening in my own farm in Moortown. Now, I never intended it to look like Japan or anywhere else in the world. I haven't even been to Japan. I was going to go to northern Japan to see some of these systems before Fukushima, and then I haven't gone because of that. But I have no specific connection to Japan, but this place is starting to look like what we call Jamont, which might be Jamont, uh, Japan and Vermont crossed, right? So we have some of our own Vermont... Um, centric stuff going on here with Icelandic sheep, which are pretty popular in Vermont, but with systems that we don't see around Vermont, right? And again, this isn't because we're trying to make it look like any specific place in the world. I don't think the full solution spectrum has, has been developed anywhere, but there are examples. So one principle here that you'll see throughout these slides is, is resiliency defined as diversity times redundancy times connectivity times manageability. For years, I used the first two, right? Resilience is diversity times redundancy. And then I realized over time that you can set up systems that far outstrip your capacity to manage them well. And you end up with a huge crop of weeds, which really isn't very resilient from a lot of angles if you can't keep up with the plant or keep up with the system. If you have too much built infrastructure, you can't maintain it and the roofs fall in. Those kinds of examples. And then also how connected the system is to itself is a key part of resiliency. This is still an oversimplification, but it's useful as a, as a metric. All right, so this is looking west on our 10 acres, which generally faces west. All of this land you're seeing has been reshaped from the bottom pond to about a mile of terraces below to the paddies to a terrace which was just planted in squash about a month before this photo. We, that's the squash we couldn't keep up with and weeds got ahead of us. Management not up to par on that one. Um, and another terrace here and a black locust planting here. And you'll see some other examples throughout these slides. So some of the principles I'll put out there. They'll, I'll put this on our website so people can see so you don't have to fever. You should try to scribble these all down. But these principles and strategies I'm going to hit on throughout the rest of the talk. All right. Um, it's not worth reading through at this, at this moment. You'll get to see them. So Okay, so this is an explanation of the photo you just saw before. 
makes it a lot clearer to see what's going on. In a tour, and we do a lot of property tours, you can really see what's happening, but a slide shows a poor, a poor substitute. So we call this fertigation, the idea of slowing, spreading, and sinking water, which is always what we're trying to do, but then actually fertilizing in the process. Water is fertilizer already. It's loaded with nitrogen. That's why things green up when you get a big rainstorm. It's not just psychological. It actually is loaded with micro and macronutrients. But if you can get water to also move other nutrients that you have in excess for you to places you have a lack of nutrients, you can fertilize at the same time. Fertilize and irrigate is, is fertigation. So, and rice patties that have existed in those other photos throughout for thousands of years, that, that's what they were doing. That is fertigation. Right? But what we want to always try to do is never let that fertility run off site. So we have fertigation happening now to, from our dairy industry, but it's fertigating Lake Champlain, which doesn't want to be fertilized. Right? It grows algae when we fertilize Lake Champlain. We want to keep it on the slopes. Right? That's, the, that's the success we're after. So that generally looks like this. It's easier to explain in photos than in drawings, some, uh, in drawings and in photos sometimes. So when we got to the land 10 years ago, this is really what was happening with the water. Right, is shunting off this primary ridge in the middle. So what we've done with that is where water runs, make it walk. Right, so now a raindrop that lands up here on top of the property used to run straight downhill like a skier would on low angle terrain, straight off the slope, 1,500 feet. Now it has to go back and forth, back and forth, through, and it, it ends up in ponds and has residence time, sits, settles out, it ends up in small pools. It runs back and forth through about a mile of swales, always settling out fertility before it leaves the site, robbing us of that fertility. If it was moving soil to begin with, if it wasn't, it still goes into plant roots and gives us the fertilizer, the, the micronutrients that are in the rain to begin with. So that's kind of an overview of what's going on in the site. There's a lot more you can see in person in a, in a tour, but here's another example of how this works, right? So if you have an existing slope where most of the water is running off, even if it's forested, um, without swales, unless the soils are very undisturbed, you get a lot of runoff on steep slopes, depending on the forest. But um, certainly if it's not forested, you get a, a surprising amount of runoff. So this is what um, converting, like, low value forest like a monoculture of white pine which we have to deal with a lot on our property to a perennial polyculture looks like see log you can also picture this being an old field and not logging for a lot for those of you that have open land already um, you lay material across on contour always on contour never across that's very very important leave stumps whenever you can dig swales so then all of a sudden the water has to run down instead of 90 plus percent running off it's checked in its movement across the slope and it has to percolate. Right? So all of a sudden water starts going into the slope and very little runs off. And then you can plant, in the meantime you can plant those swales. This is what we do throughout our property. We plant the high points and we seed the low points. Whenever there's disturbance we seed immediately as soon as possible to fill those niches. And then once the system is stable enough and, and robust enough you can start introducing animals always in a rotational way. And the biological action of this the, this system really takes hold when you bring the grazing animals in. All of a sudden now, all the biomass is being cycled, a lot of it, back into soil directly. Without grazing animals, you just can't do that very well. You can scythe it or mow it, and that does it a little bit, but a lot of that material actually oxidizes and goes back into the atmosphere. It doesn't go, you know, it's not a, a direct manure conveyor belt like uh, happens with, the, with animals. So these are our planting patterns always, right? It's on contour, never off contour. That's important. Now, we don't have to get the lasers out and be super specific about it on most of our landscapes, unless you're doing it at a very large scale. Uh, but in the desert, you do. For the most part here, if we're mostly on contour, it works well. We generally try to go mostly on contour, and if anything, leaning towards the ridges. Um, and so we bring water from the valleys to the ridges, which is a key line. That's really the basis of, of key line agriculture uh, in a lot of ways. So this is what this looks like in a photo. It's a little harder. Sorry, it's so dark. It looks I can it's clear on this, but um, so these are the mounds planted in Siberian seabury, which we plant a lot of, which you can't really see on this. Right after a rainstorm, 20 minutes from this photo, and that water's gone. It's not. It's not gone. You can't see it. It's in the soil. And this slope, for instance, is a great example of restoration and regeneration because this slope right here that you're looking at. There was nothing to mow or scythe or graze for 10 years. At least five years before I moved in and the whole time I've been there until a few years ago. This, this slope would not grow anything. 
right? I would seed it every spring multiple times. It was southwest facing and it was in drought, perpetual drought. I didn't realize that until we dug the swales. And then stuff started growing. We dug the swales, we planted the sea berries and hazelnuts, and we kept seeding. And, oh yeah, you could drop I'm that to down. Drop this, sorry. Yeah. And being subtle. And, um, in the first year after those swales, we were able to graze it twice. It couldn't have been grazed for 15 years before that. So that slowing, spreading, and sinking of water does incredible things, especially in, in drought-prone areas of land, of land, which we do have in Vermont. Um, so that's what happened on this slope. We can see now we brought the sheep in. Things are really taking hold. And so these are the same size. There's little plants, which I know you can't see very well. You want to drop that all the way down? Um, you can actually see them here barely. They've grown, you know, four feet in two years. Okay, so now uh, let's just look at some of the other some of the other strategies. This is a good example of aiming for complexity on the biological front and technological simplicity, right? So what's the technical piece here in this in this photo? The fencing, right? Which is still more technical than I like to get. I won't really be th think the system is very very optimized until I don't have any fencing. At least not fencing that's alive. If it's living fencing, sure. And will I use fencing? Uh, of course, I do. But I think of it as transitional. I don't want to depend on this kind of complexity, which is toxic in production and in, in end use, although it's very helpful to use, uh, forever. Right? That's not, we, want to, we want to evolve past that, ideally. Now, it can be very handy, especially Electronet in the meantime, using some electricity. But it's not, um, it's not nearly as elegant or as brilliant as the way these biological pieces work. It doesn't come close, right? Biomimicry, it's had billions of years of a head start working on, on uh, getting more ingenious than the technical piece. So when we're doing this and we're creating hedgerows, we're always creating microclimates. That's an important thing to keep in mind, right? And so this is a pattern you'll, we always use across any landscape in this cold part of the world is south. If south is to the left, North is to the right, you always want your tallest growing species to the north, right? So you're creating warm microclimates to the south. You're shading as little as possible. Not that cold microclimates, cool microclimates don't have their role. They do, but our whole landscape's a cool microclimate for the most part. We, our limiting factor is heat in the growing season. So we're always trying to create the warmest microclimates possible. And on the south side of hedgerows, in this zone, you can create, uh, you can create acreage that's you know, that's, that receives many hundreds of more degrees cumulatively <laughs> over the growing season, if not thousands, than just on the other side of the hedgerow or without actually creating these microclimates intentionally. Um, well, basically, the, in simple terms, you can create one or two zones warmer with the application of vertical structure. You can create a zone that's much warmer. I mean, walk, sit on this side of the building right now, sit on the entrance side. Very, it's a spectacular example of a failed microclimate. You make where everyone hangs out the cold spot, right? So it doesn't work in this climate, right? Look at, think of any north-facing side of a building you know what's going on there in this climate. Yeah, maybe you want to put your compost there or your garbage or your car. Even then it's not as nice as putting your car where the sun hits it and dries it out, um, right? We're, all, we're always scrounging everywhere we can on every site for the warmest microclimates and trying to identify them and then enhance them. That's, so, and that's an early on in the site design process. You want everything to be based around that because once you start developing a site, without that in mind, you can really put the screws to yourself in a bad way, realizing, oh, we just put this road or this hedgerow or this building in a place that then causes this cold microclimate to be created, and that's where we wanted to do you know, nine out of ten things. You want a warm spot. Uh, for what you want to do. So this is looking west on the site. Another good example of thinking of establishing a system versus maintenance, right? So we'll use Electronet and we'll use even excavators and, and sometimes we use bulldozers on client sites, um, tractors here and there. But I won't do anything on my property that makes me depend on this for the long haul. If it's using it to establish something, that's there permanently, like swales, until the next ice sheet rolls through and flattens everything again and pushes all this earth around. That's more permanent than any of the buildings we make. It seems like a great trade to me to use, you know, five gallons of diesel fuel, which is getting burned up anyways uh, through many flagrant and, and um, murderous uses, to actually create systems that don't, then don't need 
less input for thousands of years because we're creating systems that are more regenerative. We're creating swales that spread slow, spread sink water that loosen up soil that then we can plant on top of. So I have this machine for doing client work anyways and realized even though at the beginning of developing these systems that I wanted to do it all by hand. When I got out of college and got to the property, I said, we'll do all this by hand. And I realized, well, we could, but my kids would be finishing the work I could be doing you know, two years ago. So um, it's a little bit of acknowledging where we're at in the world, where, where resources are being spent, and how to use them now. I think of it now a bit as a um, kind of use it or lose it approach. You know, if I didn't use, and I just started dugging my hand and didn't use a little bit of fossil fuel to create this system, really the only result I'd have is I wouldn't have these mechanisms on the farm, and that oil would have been, the U.S. military would have still kept using that oil that I didn't use. Um, it's a little challenging philosophically, I know, but uh, <laughs> it's, it seems pretty obvious to me now, even though I had a very different approach. So this is what new swales look like right after digging and planting. We always mulch if we're planting perennials on the mounds, which we usually do. You can still do this even if you're going to do pasture, but you would spread the mound. The mounds would be more mellow, and you'd spread them out more, depending on the slope. <coughs> this is uh, some UVM interns who did some great work helping with this project. Um, Again, system establishment versus system maintenance. We'll do many different things to establish a system that we don't want to bind ourselves to in the long run. Uh, you know, a great example is, you know, tractor tillage, right? Tractor, great machine to, to establish systems. Personally, I wouldn't want to depend on it to keep a yield going. If that tractor doesn't run, if the part wasn't made in China or didn't make it on the boat to the warehouse to get to the Kubota dealership, wherever, and so my tractor is sitting there, and so I have 1,000 pounds or 10,000 pounds go to waste, at, at the scale I'm working at, I wouldn't want to depend on that. Is there a role for that? Sure, you can feed a lot of people. But um, there's a resiliency compromise in that, in that system. Right, and maybe sometimes necessarily so. We need Barry to make these, you need to reinvent Barry maybe to have all these parts localized. And then, we could, then these systems could be much, uh, much more resilient. This is planting the rice. I just go through this real quick so people can get a sense. We do a few hour workshops just on rice because it's kind of evolved. But um, really, it's just like growing a long season vegetable. So you think of it like growing onions. Not quite as long as onions, but you know, you're planting grain in seedlings. So that's a little weird. That takes some getting used to. It doesn't feel that smart when you're doing it because you got grain in seed trays, right? You're not going to grow hundreds of pounds hundreds and hundreds of pounds of grain this way until, unless you mechanize it or have you know dollar an hour labor or slave labor like in a, a lot of the world where this this grown at scale with these methods but at the home scale so much is possible that's not possible at a larger scale and if you have educational tours and groups come to your farm you can get a lot done really quickly and people get a lot out of it so we've always planted our rice crop with groups it's always been 30 to 50 people uh, planting the rice crop. And it's a perfect thing for a group to do. Just like inoculating mushrooms. We do most of our mushroom inoculation with large groups of people. People want to learn this stuff anyways. So uh, it's a great combination. So we plant the patties out in um, usually mid to late May, depending on the weather forecast. By midsummer, they're seeding out. And um, by uh, late summer, you know, you're starting to look at a pretty good rice crop coming on. And this is what it looks like probably you know, mid-June, the patties filling in, starting to get ahead of the weeds that want to crop up in the patties. Um, very complex biology starts to happen. You start to get a lot of frogs, a lot of other amphibians coming into the system, salamanders, birds, sometimes too many birds. We've had our crop lost to birds before. That's actually the biggest challenge to us is birds and weeds because wetland weeds are, you know, just as, as strong as terrestrial weeds. I mean, instead of weeding your garden, this is like a grain garden. It's really, this is a grain water garden. It's a stormwater detention basin that is edible. That's really the best way to think of this. And the cool part about this is the, are the patties, not the rice. The rice is, is great, but what's really the smart thing going on here is that we're not losing any fertility, and we're actually capturing fertility. So we're net accruing fertility here. So if we don't want to grow rice down the road, we can just pull these berms into the patties and we'll just have fertile terraces to grow whatever else we want to grow. Yeah. It's the only source of your water rain. Yes. But it's rain that's stored in ponds. So this like this tube for instance, this hose will siphon water from a pond above it. But yeah, it's all rainwater. It's all surface stormwater. We don't tap into a well for this. 
we don't um, we don't have a stream. We don't have a perennial stream on our on the land. We're actually generally ten acres on a slight ridge, and there's zero to twelve inches of subsoil to bedrock over probably three of the acres. So it's a ridgy, ledgy. You know, it was a poor farmer that that had their lot to farm that piece of land that we're on. Um, and that's why I like it, because it's a good example of what most of the world is like. It's not a big, you know, um, at, you know, Virgen's loam, you know, flat field. That's where it lets you do anything you want, really. You even abuse it year after year, and it'll still incredibly grow seven feet of corn every year. It's amazing. Um, we have to be much more careful. It's much less forgiving. Right, so right after construction, these patties were one year old in this photo, and look at the sward of vetch and clover and radish and turnip growing in these berms. So that's also a crop. We pulled out hundreds of pounds of roots out of the berms. Whenever we excavate, we, we seed and large, and, you know, in mass. I, I like to joke, a piece of heavy machinery should come with a, a bag of 20 species of seeds strapped to the side of it because that machinery is going to blow holes in the ecosystem, which can actually be very regenerative, but only if the niches then are filled with beneficial species and not just left to run off into the rivers uh, and have goldenrod come into it and fern and bramble. This is what late summer looks like. We're integrating ducks into these systems. There's a lot to talk about with the rice, with fertility cycling. But the long short of it is, it needs very little fertility beyond the rain. We do um, use a fertigation pool. We have like a manure tea pool that we siphon from, that we just dunk burlap bags full of sheep manure bedding from the barn from the winter. Um, we'll you know, human, put human urine in it, just we'll save the pee, piss in a bucket during the summer, put that in there, use basically make manure tea, and then feed the patties with manure tea water, never to the point that they overflow. And then ducks, which have a very multi-thousand-year-old synergy with rice, we're experimenting with in the last few years to integrate into the system. It's tricky because, like with everything smart in, in land use and biology, it's all about timing, right? If your ducks are just a little too big and the rice is just a little too small, the ducks will knock the rice right over. The ducks have to be the right size and the rice has to be the right size. So baby ducks are, are definitely the best. They can't eat the rice because it's too high in silica, but they can eat everything else. So they turn all the weeds into fertilizer for the rice, leaving just the rice. That's probably a good example of coevolution because people have been working with both these systems for quite a long time. Um, so it's neat to see in practice. Here's the rice once it's harvested. It's very easy to dry. The best thing about rice in the end is that it's a grain. Once, once you, if you're able to process it, it stores for years. You know, we've had crop loss for two years in a row. I've got seed from three years ago. I'll be able to plant that seed in ten years. There's still viable grain seeds found in the pyramids. So planting, you know, for a full growing season failure, for instance, is, is viable if you have a little bit of grain or a little bit of, you know, hard seed um, on hand. Or if you have animals um, and, and a hay crop. This is what it looks like before it's hulled. This is what it looks like after. It's short grain brown rice. And uh, all rice is brown rice before it's processed. But it's the short grain variety we're growing, one, one variety of short grain. We were lucky to find a dehuller in a barn in central Vermont, which is actually very, very strange because this probably may be one other or two other in the continent. It might be the only one. It happened to be sitting in a barn unused in central Vermont. I guess I'm supposed to grow rice because, you know, it's just inconceivable that this thing was sitting in a barn that I went to to buy a wood stove and saw this thing and said, what was it? He says, oh, you don't want that. It's actually for processing rice. No one grows rice anywhere near here. Uh, he, he, he passed it on, a co I think, it was a few hundred bucks, but it'd be a couple thousand bucks to ship in from Osaka, Japan, which is where these are made. Um, and it would be, you'd have to be quite a metal worker, and it would take probably a week or two to reverse engineer it and figure out how to make it and get it to work. You could, and, and we should, but um, right now it's the community dehuller, and we have friends come by with their crop um, and give us a little seed when our crop failed, which was nice this year, so we could still eat some and not just have, you know, seed, seed crop. This is our leach field. Right? You might as well figure out what to do in the most fertile part of your property. Because most of us, if you have a leach field, it is the most fertile, fertile spot on site. And we've been experimenting with that. And sure enough, squash do well. Sunflowers keep growing and growing and growing. And if you want a big wall of green, that's great. right? But if you want the sunflower seeds, why, why might that be? What's, what's wrong there? It's right. It's constant. Oh, we're, you guys are all farmers and gardeners. I, sometimes I ask that and people wonder. Um, so another example of system establishment versus system maintenance isn't just when it involves inputs, it's when it involves time. 
I don't want to go foliar feed all my hundreds and hundreds of fruit, food trees on the property. But to get them started, I'll do that because it's so brilliant what this does for plants. We've, this is a pear tree which we ate a pear off, off of this year for the first time four years ago. This is planted in basically ledge. It would not grow without a heavy mulching and also some foliar feed. But with a foliar feed and just a little bit of technology here that's very fixable if it breaks and, and can last a long time, and you can feed it you know, urine water or any type of human manure, you, any type of uh, fo uh, manure tea you make, a little fish emulsion is awesome, or seaweed, um, you can get a plant established in a place that otherwise you wouldn't be able to. And once that plant starts to be established, it starts creating an ecosystem for itself that it can survive and sometimes even thrive in, you don't need to keep up with this regimen. So we will do things in the first few years of establishing a perennial system that we would never want to sign up to do for you know, a long period of time. Uh, the animal systems are a good example of it. So there's a cure who I brought here as an example of an important part of the system, more important than I realized when I first got her. Because keeping the animals, especially the poultry, alive is key. We're able to save a lot of time without not dealing with like, you know, jailing up the poultry every night or always worrying about them being eaten because we have two dogs running around. So that's a nice example. They're, they're really worth their feed, you know, their, their input cost for that reason alone. Uh, uh, never mind, you know, the joy factor, which is just through the roof. Um, but the animal systems here I'll go through for a second. So these are baby runner ducks, which actually were We've tried a bunch of other ducks since starting with runners. We heard about it in Elliot Coleman's books early on. And we might move back to runners because some of these other uh, m supposed to be better ducks don't seem that cold hardy. We'll see. We'll know after another year or two if that's true. We let the ducks free range and fence the gardens. And in general, we're moving away from fencing animals to fencing things that don't move, like gardens. Now, that's impossible with everything at all stages of the system. But again, I won't. The fencing is like. Really the worst part of this whole, my whole life, really, in a lot of ways, is fencing, right? You're always dealing with fencing when you have animals, so I'm not going to be convinced there's not a better way until a lifetime of trying to find a better way, because it's just ridiculous how much time goes into dealing with fencing, buying fencing, replacing fencing, and uh, the vegetable gardens don't move on their own, neither do the trees, so, like, maybe we fence those. Um, or figure out the animal integration system such that ideally the animals don't damage your, tr your perennials too badly. And, and that can be worked out with the size of the perennials and the size of the animals. So there's a, there's a synergy possible there. We found that with ducks and chickens, not so much with sheep, especially with sheep with horns. Um, no, but we don't free range sheep. Sometimes we do, unintentionally. <laughs> they generally stick around, but they eat all your, you know, two-year, three-year-old fruit trees. At least Icelandics do. Now, you know, if we wave a magic wand, we'd have, like, a, a, an ungulate that, like, has a bill, if that's possible. Like, you know, something that can eat coarse, woody debris, coarse, brushy debris, but doesn't want to browse. Now, that doesn't exist as far as I know, uh, but... South down sheep might be close just because they're so small. It's hard. It's impossible to get a true south down in the country, I'm told. But there are some small sheep. We're going to mess around with geese in this process this year. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. As Mark, really, the whole thing is pasture except where the buildings are. And when we had goats, even the buildings were pasture. But we do have a perimeter fence. But we we always we'll bring them through the. I mean, we'll bring even the sheep through the veggie gardens at certain times of the year. Um, and we try to graze, especially with our fruit, fruits and nuts, regularly. But then we have what we call a pasture, which is the bottom five acres, which still has is still planted in a silvo pasture system, but it's more open. But that's in a very important point, and what I've come to realize is it all needs to be grazed from a regeneration and resiliency standpoint. Because even between fruit trees, you can mulch the crap out of a bunch of a hedgerow or a bunch of fruit trees and nut trees. Give it a little time, and there'll be grass growing under that tree. Or at least where there's not comfy, there'll be grass in between the alleys. So mowing, you can mow it, or you can mulch. If you had unlimited labor and unlimited wood chips, you could mulch. But those do not, you know, one's not so doable, and the constant mowing is just an expense for very little output. So ideally, that's all cycled through animals and, gra and grazed. Um, and that's, that's a challenge, because the animals will damage perennials. That's what 
question. Your sheep don't non-bark and rub against the bark. One of them did. Sheep yeah. So, and it's very individual. I've learned when to be very skeptical when people say, "Oh, well, this breed does this and this breed does this." Well, what what animal? You have to get to know each animal, yeah, really, you know, because I had one one particular individual would eat our sea berries. Thorny, he loved them. The little ram. Yeah. It, so it's it, it's <laughs> you, you have to co-evolve with the system over a long period of time, I think, to get to a real optimization. Um, now there's a scale challenge there. Um, it would we're, we're, I think sheep with horns are great because you can grab them easily for, for managing them, um, to work on them, to inspect them, but the horns they'll rub. So lack of horns is a good thing if you're trying to grow a lot of trees and perennials. And growing a lot of perennials within pasture is a no-brainer. I mean, even if you're just a shepherd and you don't want to grow trees, you'll get better grass production with trees in your pasture. So it's amazing to me to see relatively smart grazers otherwise not planting any shade. I mean, the animals need shade, too, just to avoid stress, especially hardy sheep. Any animal that's hardy in Vermont winter is going to want some shade in the summer. And then you get more moisture throughout the driest part of the year, the last half of the summer, when sward production goes tanks and goes to nothing almost. And you're doing great by soil and wildlife, and you're getting timber and fodder and bee production and all these other yields in the process. So we plant black locusts like crazy and all they're throughout our pastures. We've This is called the Dawn Treader. We've done like mob stock chickens, meat birds for land restoration. That's been very successful, but it's a lot of work. We couldn't keep up with moving this over super sloping 10 to 40 percent grade ground with boulders everywhere without getting run over by it a few times. So, you know, if we had more time, this this kind of mobile chicken coop thing would have maybe worked. But on land like ours, like a lot of most of Vermont, you know, you better wear a helmet if you're going to haul this thing around. But or have a few people. Um, it's great in concept and on a farmland, quote unquote. Yeah, Joel Salatin makes a tons of sense, do all that stuff. But if you have what's most of Vermont, you, you just can't do it unless you have an excavator, you know, mini excavator haul the thing around if you have a lot of chickens. Um, or draft horses, maybe. We're always spreading dozens of species of seed, sometimes azomite and green sand, another great example of establishing systems and versus maintaining them. I, I don't plan to buy any green sand or azomite in 10 years, and I don't. When I've got a vegetable garden, when, when there's, after something has that material put into it, we never put it in again because we're keeping our soil as much as possible. But to establish, it seems great for remineralization and, and the health aspects of, of what's in the plant, the nutrient density pieces and the soil food web pieces as well. One aspect we've experimented with now twice and are becoming very enamored of for, you know, fixing, for basically re regenerating very, very poor old abandoned field, which is what we have a lot to work with, and there's millions of acres of this stuff in New England, is fire. And it's hard to actually get any piece of Vermont to catch on fire. It's only a very small part of the year when, you, when it's doable, and even then it might require some propane. Um, but just in the spring, sometimes, most years we'll have the right days when the wind's down. If you do it carefully, you can actually burn, you know, kind of suboptimal biomass that's squelching out a lot of new growth. Things like fern and brambles um, and goldenrod leaves to clear germination beds that they, you then seed immediately and bump up the pH to get very vigorous growth. So this, this is what this looked like in the spring, two springs ago. This is what it looked like a month after the fire. The, the goldenrod and, and um, some rushes and some brambles came back through. Then we side them once because it didn't tax all their energy. But look at what came up with the understory. You see there's a clover understory coming up under these brambles and kind of suboptimal pasture in this photo fertilized and given a seed bed, given a start by the fire, and then come like early summer, it started to look like this. Come late summer, it looked like this. That's vetch up to my belly button, growing up clover, um, turnip, radish. There's almost no brambles in here or fern. It's almost all soil building, nitrogen fixing plants, dynamic accumulating plants, and plants that are good for grazing animals. And the stem density has gone through the roof. So all of a sudden, we're building a ton of soil quickly with the help of that disturbance and there's an important point there and that is regarding disturbance which is disturbance is key it's disturbance is a fact of life it's a question of what the kind of disturbance you want to apply you can think of permaculture any type of regenerative land use as managed carefully managed disturbance we we need disturbance to actually 
stimulate the kind of ecosystem response that's most beneficial. Um, but it's a question of what kind of disturbance and what happens after the disturbance. So seeding after fire, for instance. If you're just going to burn or you're just going to use excavators and not seed after, better just leave it alone. But if you're going to seed after, much better to get in there and do some healing work, you know, one-on-one -on -one with, the, with the system. So once we've brought the animals into the system about halfway through how long I've been there. So I've been there, let's say, almost 10 years. Animals now, grazing animals and ducks for three to five years, depending on the animal. And the system is really starting to take off now. The abundance and kind of the lushness of the land, the amount of life coming out of the land has really gone up now that we're able to get animals on it. And if I had known better, I would have gotten grazing animals on there sooner, for sure. Um, it's just incredible. But they have to be managed very carefully or they can start tipping the scales and starting to actually, they can start to be degenerative. Just like fire, just like water, just like heavy machinery, animals can be regenerative or they can be degenerative. It's all about their timing and their application and their densities um, and their connectivity, you know, their association with other things. So there's a good example of the resiliency metric there. This sheep we sold and went to a place that didn't have chickens, and she died a fly strike a month later. I didn't realize in this photo that the chickens, I didn't know what they were doing. I thought they were just, I thought they might be eating something. I didn't realize they were eating fly larvae. So... When you put things together, you get synergies that are unexpected and you didn't even know what they were at the time, right? That kind of John Todd idea of throw all the organisms together, they'll figure it out. You, you just have to uh, orchestrate, you know, you just have to, uh, you're the assembler. It's far more um, complex and, and full of intelligence than we can actually realize. Uh, another big important piece, right, is, is structural diversity. We know this, I've learned this in studying marine biology, but don't hear it in the terrestrial realm, that structural diversity begets biological diversity. But you know if you drop, if a ship sinks to a sandy bottom, what happens in the ocean? Right, a reef starts, because structural diversity, prey can hide from predation. You all of a sudden get diversity simply from the architecture. That's true on the land, too, but we don't, we don't have that language like we do in, in the marine realm uh, nearly enough. So that means earthworks, that means perennial plants, vertical structure, built elements, and plant elements, animal elements, all mixed in. This is uh, six weeks old, these terraces. They were bare earth with carved by a mini excavator six weeks before this photo. Right? The, and these, these never were green for 10 years. They wouldn't grow because we're right under a hemlock, and they wouldn't grow anything, and it's ledgy. That disturbance was key, and then what followed the disturbance? Stones coming right from this stones from right. Oh yeah, we don't bring. We don't need to bring any stone in. We, we have stone and woody debris. That's 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 our currency, really. We we've got a lot of it. Uh, so we we need to figure out how to how to put it to work. Um, bees. What a what a great example of maximizing inputs for minimum in, maximizing outputs for minimizing inputs. Right. They're out there working. Hopefully, if they're healthy, every day of the summer doing an amazing amount of work, distilling value from the landscape at large. Um, we need to get a lot better with bees, personally, and I think as a society as well, um, and, and pollinators in general. Just incredible. So this is what a pond berm looks like a month after digging and establishing a pond berm, a dam of a pond, right? So this is classically when you have a problem. We have the opposite of a problem here. We have soil building happening quickly. It's pure clover and vetch coming up because we've had that seed bed. If, if there's... You know, really just one or two points that I want you to leave here today with. It's that disturbance mechanism piece and the, and the water, slow it, spread it, sink it piece. Um, it's just so important. And sometimes to get the kind of ecosystem going that's most optimal, that's most soil productive, that's most food and medicinal productive and best for the climate and wildlife, takes disturbance. It's not just what we got. If what we got was pristine, that might be true. But it's all already been bulldozed and cut over and toxify via acid rain and, and mercury in the rain. You know, it's, it's already all touched, and we got to have to remember that. So um, to leave something alone as a healing mechanism is be like leaving a victim, you know, someone who's a victim of something saying, oh, you know, just fix yourself. You know, we don't want to help you out. It's the same analogy. Um, we're always planting trees, perennials. We have probably planted about 2,500 trees on 10 acres, and I think we could plant another 10,000 before we're really, like, full and space-wise. Now, I know that's kind of crazy because it's like trees take up so much room, but when you plant hedgerows, 
you can plant black locust every eight inches and you'll have a crop of fence posts in six to eight years. And that can eat up, that can be, you know, thousands of trees on a small amount of space. So when you think of trees as, as a cropping system beyond just the way we see trees in our suburban landscape or most of our farm landscapes, our woodlands, uh, you start to realize that you need to be your own nursery or you're not going to be able to afford to buy thousands of trees. And luckily, being your own nursery is easy. We make our own apples every year for very low cost because we, we have enough apples now to service our own sign wood production, our own cuttings. Um, apples are, I think they, they're really going to be our, uh, our this culture's t one of our totem trees. If we're here in another 100 or 500 years, this is like our coconut to some extent. Maybe not quite as great as a coconut it was for Polynesians or still is, but pretty amazing just for the sheer diversity of what you can produce from apples and how reliable they are. And we had a great apple year a few years ago, and I saw apples in the woods above my house, like zone two. I you know, walked this area a hundred times. It's like literally a hundred feet from where I sleep. I'm like who, who dropped apples in here? Like someone throw apples into my property? There was an apple tree there about this big, stuck up in the canopy, never noticed it. It made apples. The thing was half dead for 20 years, totally shaded, producing fruit, you know, in the woods. So I, I grafted another 50 apples that year just knowing Wow, you know, it's, a, it's really a powerful tree. But it is subject to the late frost like we saw this year. You know, it used to be easy to talk, easier to talk up apples until last spring and last year. No wild apples anywhere around me in my neighborhood. The trees that always produced. So there's, there's a lack of resiliency in tree crops from a flowering perspective. There's a great amount of climate resiliency elsewise but not from, the, you know, all you have to do is have 31 degrees and flowers toast. If flowers toast, the fruit's gone. Wait another year. So that's why you need many eggs in your basket. Hazelnut flowers are hardy to how, what temperature? 10 degrees, right? We had a lot of hazelnuts last year. So diversity, 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 and then more diversity. It's always a backdrop principle and strategy. Here's our hazelnut crop two years ago. And they've only been in the ground for three years now, or four. Um, bur oak is a very fast-growing nut. It's already starting to want to produce acorns. Um, but it gives me hope that I think it will be something we don't have to wait a very long time for. Um, we're growing a lot of stuff that, that literally was on the property that would be easily viewed as a weed in a lot of farms we just cut down. Anyone know what these are? Hawthorn. Right, so super medicinal. I didn't realize how medicinal it was even when I was making medicine out of it at this point, until um, I started hanging out with a great herbalist and naturopath who has made me realize just how central of a medicine tree this is. I mean, this is one of the most important medicine trees for many cultures throughout the world, and they grow like weeds in parts of Vermont. Um, so we actually have a hawthorn orchard that got planted for us in the last ten years, which we never planted. I never realized they're there. We can mulch them a little, let them grow, encourage them and have a super medicinal farm, you know, farm crop as a result. We have found that pears graft onto them, so you can make a deer-proof pear tree by grafting hawthorn above browse line. Somebody that works that. well. Somebody that they said, no, you can't. Yeah, well, there's the proofs in the pudding, right? I wouldn't have believed it either unless, you know, I got, I got to see it. Um, and so, you know, the hawthorn's very vigorous, so it can overtake these shoots, but we've had success with pear on mountain ash that are already existing and mountain ash are very soil hardy so you can get them to grow in places pear wouldn't be so happy and then put pears on them you know above above browse line if deer are a problem which they are in a lot of places woody debris of course we have more wood than we do soil so how do we make woody debris lignin cellulose our soil essentially our currency our growing medium well fungi allow us to do that right wood is soil to fungi so we can take wood that either we're thinning from, from a silvicultural perspective um, or pollarding. We're always pollarding red maple, cutting it about six feet up. And then we have groups come. is a great opportunity to drill and plug with shiitake, and then we get these kinds of flushes. Nutrient-dense, 30% protein, very impotent anti-cancer um, crop, not plant, but super medicinal. You know, it's important, I think, ever important that we get these things in our diet and kind of have a piece of the fungi world connected with ourselves with what we're putting into our water, our food, or what we call food, and our air increasingly every day. And the great thing is they're very passively produced, right? We can dry them with no technology except for a screen. And they actually are improved. They go up in vitamin D versus degraded. A lot of plant 
crops are degraded if you dry in the sun. So especially if you do gills up, apparently, vitamin D goes through the roof. So transforming dead matter into living, that's always primary strategy. Right? It's always what we're trying to do. Bedrock is the ultimate resource. There's plenty of it. Things like fungi mine that bedrock. Mycelium actually can, can turn that mineralogical resource into complex <laughs> biology. Swine caps we've had good, good results with over time. We used to get tons of them, and then we didn't keep up with the massive amount of mulching we were doing early on in the system, which was totally worthwhile, but we haven't been able to keep up with it, and then the wine cap strafaria flushes started to kind of tone back. But a great example of, of many yields uh, from just throwing things together. I didn't know what these species were at first. I was walking around, and my friend, who's a good, um, good mushroom head, saw these. He's like, why aren't you eating your wine caps? What are you doing with letting all these mushrooms go by? And I, it was two years after planting. I said, I, those are edible? And he's like, yeah, how would you get so many? And what I didn't know, but it must have been from root dipping our plants in a whole mix of mycorrhizal and other fungi, beneficial bacteria, rooting natural rooting hormones. So always root dip your bare root plants because you're, then you're inoculating your soil and you might get a lot of mushrooms out of it to boot. And that's why I like to say, even if you go plant a thousand trees or a hundred and none of them live, if you plant them well with root dips and a little bit of amendments, you're just improving your site anyways, even if they all died. You're opening up the soil, putting good stuff in it, closing it back again. So, and they usually almost, most of them live anyways, even with some neglect, if you're planting the right species. We've got an um, oyster from uh, poplar, and that's a great way of adding value, right? Poplar's pretty low value wood for most uses, for almost any use. But you can turn it into very high value golden oyster, other oyster. We once got morels one year, they didn't come back. But, you know, it was worth trying. We made a, a bonfire in the woods and seeded them and... They came up, and we're like, well, we're, we're going to farm or else. This is a great business model. <laughs> they didn't want to come back. Some things are not that easy. Um, so, I mean, that's a creature, right? That's like a living being. Probably has a brain. We just don't know where it is, right? So they're not, they're not easily worked with just like that. Um, of course, I'll just end on, a, on a, uh, some heat notes here, because we're talking about heat, heating, uh, keeping ourselves fed on some, and building soil on some of these former slides. But keeping ourselves warm in this climate takes a lot more energy than staying fed, right? Your, your basal metabolism only uses uh, about an eighth to a twentieth or less if you live in a really un inefficient home as your house does to stay warm and have your pipes freeze, right? Could you eat all this wood? Right? That's a lot of material. When you carry a load into your wood stove, think about eating that amount of food, right? <laughs> So we need a lot more solar energy that falls on our site needs to go to keep us warm than to feed us. So more acreage needs to be devoted to it. So fuel with self-reliance is much more difficult to achieve for like the small holder than, than it's easy to feed yourself if you just spend some time in the garden, like a lot of time. And you process, but a lot of time in September. You really don't need, an, you don't need a fraction of an acre to do that if you build up your soils and you get good at it. But to stay warm is, is a lot more difficult, right? And so what we do is always work on the efficiency side first. Use as little as possible, right? Simplification of means, the first strategy. So we heat a small home on one to one and a half quarts of wood. It's just insulated well, and we burn very well, and we dry the wood very well, and we construct our fires very carefully and manage them carefully. But it's not that hard to do with some mindfulness and some, some good technology. Um, this wood stove is the most important piece of technology on the property, bar none. It's an airtight wood cook stove. Heats 1,500 square feet. We cook on it. We bake in it. We dry on it and heats all of our hot water. It'll boil a 40-gallon tank if we don't take a bath for a couple days. So you have to bathe in the winter or you know, shower for a long time to keep that tank cool enough which is a great problem to have in a cold climate. That's easy, okay, or just run the hot water, right? Pour it in a bucket and, you know, pour it in your compost outside. It's easy to, you can always get rid of heat. So, incredible, um, it's been blown me away after experimenting with appropriate technology for 15 years, doing diesel, diesel veggie oil work and all sorts of stuff. Most non-living technologies are always disappointing in the end, right? They never live up to their promises. They break sooner, or they need more parts, or they're more expensive. They don't quite work as well as they said, or you need a part, or they break. And this has worked much better than I expected or needed it to. It could work half as well, and it'd still be totally worth it, and I'd love it. But it actually is so effective 
um, it's blown me away. So in this photo, we're, we're making chagarishi tea and making a, a lamb venison, you know, green stir fry and boiling um, gone by squash for the ducks and baking cookies and heating all our hot water and heating our space as well and, and drying gloves for skiing. So multiple functions with single elements, right? Always Wilkin we're trying to do. Now, a little much more higher technology, much more breakable, but so key, I recommend to folks they become chainsaw self-reliant. Because if you're bucking all your, chain, all your wood by hand, well, you won't have time to do a lot of other things. Could you do it? Yeah. You'd have to get crazy strong. But you, this is a major time saver. So right now you can buy all the parts you need and the equipment you need to run a chainsaw for 20 years, as long as you can get a little bit of gasoline with no fl global flow of parts. That whole vulnerable flow of parts could stop. And you can be out there bucking your wood and then going to help your neighbor buck saw it because he's still working on one log when you've got your wood put up for the year. Um, just to mention, it's, it's an important thing to think about. So, and if you make your own chain, it's much cheaper in the long run, and then you can be a resource for your community because you can make chains... Uh, for others, you, you save a lot of money rather than buying um, chain. One of those examples of, you know, put some money, spend some money up front or some resources up front that's going to save you so much in the long run. That's always what we're trying to do because we, I look at it like we have abundance now. We have crazy abundance. I don't, I'll be surprised if we look back and we ever have more, a more abundant time than 2005 to 2013, somewhere in here, maybe it'll last a bit longer. So utilize those resources, those resources, leverage present day resources for tomorrow, leverage them now. I mean, I go into the co-op, go to the bulk department, I'm just blown away. It's like, what kind of quinoa do I want from South America? Like, what kind of nut from which continent do I feel like eating today? You know, leverage it for what it's worth. I want to make those options last a long ways into the future because we won't be able to look back if we, if we don't have those resources Look back and, and you know wish we did won't do much good. So on the wood heating piece, we've just run some numbers, and the interesting thing is, even in a very efficient home, you use at least eight times more energy to heat than to, to be fed, heat than eat. And if you look at cords of wood, and most homes in Vermont, if they're going to heat just on wood, would be at least six cords a year. Most homes that do that say they heat with wood use some supplemental heat, and they use four to six, three to six. Um, and this, over the year, you're moving between 12,000 and 72 or 96,000 pounds of wood at least, you know, at least twice, if not more, right? So, yeah, there's some, uh, some comments on that on the right. But so, you, there's not, once your system's set up, there's nothing you have to move around as much weight-wise as wood when everything's set up. Now, when things in system establishment, you're building buildings or moving or making swales, there's other things going on. But once it's all dialed in, you're always moving massive amounts of wood or stone for stone walls. So you want to dial that in. And in terms of maximum outputs from minimum inputs, here's a forest. Here's, here's 20 cords of wood every 20 years for hundreds of years. What's the tree? It's only one tree in this climate that will do that. And, and fix nitrogen and be the most rot resistant wood we can grow. Black locust. Amazing gift from the gods tree. Got to plant it. Plus, it's illegal to plant in Massachusetts when they make it. If they do make it illegal here, it'll be like one of those things you look back on. It, which, because it's, they call it very invasive. It likes to do really well on beat up sites that were abused and then abandoned. And it does. It's a soil, it's a soil builder, rapid nitrogen fixer. So it's also, they say you can make more honey on an acre black locust than any other tree. We grow it in hedgerows. This is three years ago. You see, take a, try to remember what these look like. They're like two years after whips. These are all planted, you know, from, from whips, right? They're all planted from that size. We don't buy big trees. A year later, they're like this, 25 feet tall. We'll have fence posts next year from trees we planted just a handful of years ago. And then we'll let some go for bigger materials, for millable. It's the most rot-resistant wood we can get. So I would love to buy black locust. You can't buy it. So, so is it considered invasive study? Could it cause problems elsewhere? No, a lot of things are considered invasive that are just fantastic and don't spread. We haven't had these spread at all. But we graze underneath them. So if a little shoot comes up, it's grazed twice a year. It doesn't, you know, it's not, um, you know, something Monsanto made. It's just, yeah, it stays there. So, and if it keeps shooting up, it's just building soil. We keep cutting it, side it, graze it. It's gr Next to clover and comfrey, it's the choice food for our sheep. Yeah, apparently it's amazing for sheep. A lot of people with sheep 
say it's fantastic for sheep. And when you see, the, I mean, I, a great test for any grazing animals is if you have, if they have a lot of options, you give them a lot of options to eat and they're not hungry, see what they eat. Don't ever do it when they're hungry or they'll eat something that's poisonous. But sheep and most animal, grazing animals are very smart about what they're very selective. They smell, they know if it's good for them or not. Uh, for the most part, I've heard it's toxic. It can be toxic in high doses to horses. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of stuff's toxic to horses. <laughs> yeah, most animals won't eat stuff that's toxic to them unless they don't have a other alternative. Red maple is supposedly toxic to sheep. We have red maple everywhere. The sheep, once in every now and then, when they need that medicine, they eat on it. But it's, it's, it, they can have low, uh, tr uh, dump, uh, wheelbarrow load of comfrey, which will harvest for them, and clover and vetch and great stuff, orchard grass and, and ryegrass, and then if they can reach black locust branches, they do. And we'll also prune it for them and drop it down, so we're turning black locust into soil directly. In places that, you know, there's a lot of places that only black locusts will grow, or a handful of other species. I mean, it's very, if it's sunny, and there's some gravel, it can grow. Can't take it very wet, so up on swales is very important. Now, one last very important principle would be remiss not to mention is it's easy to overshoot your ability to manage by going crazy establishing yeah. systems, right? So this is just, I needed to do all this in one, in two days in the summer last year. Well, that didn't happen. I mean, this list still probably has boxes that aren't checked off, right? That's just summer craziness, like get all this stuff done. And that takes, so people become the limiting factor. Right? It's not really anything else. It's, it's, it's people. And that's great because if we're going to have 8 billion or 9 billion people, let's make people a limiting factor. Let's figure out how to be use, useful, very useful. Um, no better way than a regenerative, resi highly resilient, very intensive landscape. But keep it in mind that it's very easy to establish more systems than you actually have the capacity to manage. There's a black locust blossom, edible also. So it's actually a food crop. You can think of it as a food crop. It's amazing in omelets. Just some shots of, uh, I'll end on, of how we eat now. In the last two years, we've started to mostly eat from the land. And I didn't realize it until I started going to the co-op in the fall. I hadn't gone in a long time. And I went there, and I realized, I looked around, and I was like, I don't really need anything, but I bought some chocolate and coffee. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of creeps up on you. And I don't spend, time, again, time's a limiting factor. I'd have a lot more if I spent my time, most of my time, homesteading and farming. I don't. I, I also teach and do design work and consulting for a living. So I'm not on the land doing all this, you know, every day, all day. But um, this is what some of the yields are starting to look like. What, where are we at time-wise? We, we are out of the Okay. So I'll wrap up with just some nutrient-dense slides here. This is what the harvest is looking like more and more. We're focused on, not, on staples on one end, really reliable staples like potatoes. I love them. And cabbage and squash. Like think Carol Deppy, resilient gardener types of stuff. And then on the other end, nutrients, pure nutrients. Things like sea berries, uh, blueberries, honey berries. We have 25 different types of species, species of fruits and maybe another 50 varieties. There's one plant in this, in this barrel, right, that's just for fun. Not nutrient dense and it's not a staple. Lemon cukes, right? It's cucumber. I mean, it's cooling. It's fine. But you don't, it's just bonus. It's like tomatoes. If you want lycopene, grow autumn olive. There's like no lycopene in tomatoes compared to autumn olive. 40 times the lycopene of tomatoes. Garlic, that's one example of food medicine. One word, I use it in my book. It's food, it's medicine, grow a lot of it. It's easy to save seed, it's easy to improve. During the growing season, it's easy. We have to figure out, stor storage is a huge pro uh, focus for us because you can grow more food than you can eat in three months of the year here. That's really easy if you put the time in. But what are you going to eat the rest of the year? So storage becomes the whole thing. We've experimented with a clamp, which is just a hole in the ground. This worked great except for apples and cabbages. The potatoes were much tastier than when we put them in the ground in the fall. Amazing what they did um, over the winter. Some of our nutrient-dense medicines. So the medicine-making side of it is really where we're trying to focus a lot on. Because stuff like this, Fukushima, we have our own Fukushima possibilities, all these red dots. Fukushima's down the road. Possible, unless we are perfect in our man management and there's no natural disaster or other disasters, right? So we need to, staying fed's one thing, staying healthy is a whole nother, right? N none of the rates, cancer, all this, none of these things are on the decrease. Most all of them are on the rise. So what's that going to look like in 50 years? So allying with plant medicine, especially and fungi medicine, uh, is becoming basic every day, like consuming medicine every day. 
at, med, our food as very potent medicine every day. And some of it you don't have to grow yourself. You can just forage, like a great big reishi we found last year. Wheatgrass you can grow in the middle of winter in a, in a um, windowsill. A greenhouse we established this year to help us do this throughout more throughout the year. Kimchi, krauts, can't beat them. Shiitake, garlic, all sorts of kombucha and, and medicinal syrups that stay that can keep for years. So, and on this note, right, the value of a lot of this stuff, the best values are intergenerational, right? We can only do so much in our lifetime, right? That, that quote about if you're if uh, what you're focused on trying to do is uh, can it be achieved in your lifetime, you're not asking the right questions. It's really great because a lot of the, the system, the true possibilities we have to hand down from generation to generation, we won't get there if we're starting from scratch every generation, right? So the possibilities are out there. This bridge was made by hand before the oil age in central New Hampshire. It will probably outlive the cheap oil age and all the other bridges that were built with all of this cheap energy, but craftsmanship was involved and it was the scale was different. The level of skill was very different. Uh, connection with materials. So if we want to feed our kids persimmons and not iPods, we have a, a long way to go, but we can start right now. Here's a planted ecosystem. This is, this is not nat quote unquote natural. Humans are nature working, right? This is a planted chestnut system, but you have to hand these things down to your grandkids. This is in Greece. Nut pines, bear for 400 years, chestnuts. And these principles and strategies are only good, right, if we follow them and start in, start digging. So start planting. We can all do this. We're the only ones that are going to do this for ourselves, so we might as well start. Thanks. And just one quick announcement. For more information, this is the tip of the iceberg, obviously. Come out, see our farm, or take our permaculture course, or pass the word about it, or check out our book. There's a postcard about it for up here. Our book will be out in two, three months and gets into much more detail on all of these systems.